Good morning, Daiwa Farm, and a welcome to this morning online service. Go in that comment section down below and tell us how you've been, how your week has been, and feel free to share this video with others so that they can be blessed. In Luke, it says, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Now join me as we head into this morning's equipping moment. Well, welcome again. It's always a pleasure to have you join with us on this Sunday morning worship. Before we sow, we understand that we must have in mind what type of harvest we want. In essence, it is important we understand what we want to sow into people's life. Why? Because every fruit is a display of the type of seed sown. The word that comes into your air is seed. And that word is planted in your heart and it will eventually produce fruit. Today we want to continue and we want to talk about selecting the soil. Selecting the soil. It's not just about only selecting the seed, but selecting the soil. The soil is the receptacle into which the seed is placed. It is the human heart or the spirit. Matthew chapter 13, we want to get into that scripture, talks about the seed as the word. And it goes on to explain that the condition of the soil or the heart into which the seed is sown. The seed is exposing the condition and the quality of the soil. The scripture speaks about choosing the right soil. In the parable of the sower and the seed, we find four ground conditions. And the, here's what the scripture says in Matthew 13 from verse 1. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plant was scorched and they withered because there was no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has an heir, let him hear. Now the soil that the seed fell on represented four categories of the human heart. We see, first of all, the hard heart. And this, these are the ones that hear the word but do not believe. Then secondly, we see the shallow heart. They hear the word but has shallow roots, and as a result, they cannot sustain the pressure of the world. Then you have the crowded heart. They are too busy. These are the ones that lose interest in the things of God. And then the fruitful heart, they receive the word, they apply the word, and so they are able to bear fruit. Jesus goes on to explain this parable. And this is what he said. He says, listen to what the parable of the sower means. In verse 19, he says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatch away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed that was sown along the path. Now hear the word. This is what he says. They hear the word, but they do not understand or they lack the understanding. The Greek meaning of understanding speaks about the ability to bring together, to set a joining together of mind, heart, and spirit. So when we receive the word, it must go further than our minds, further than our air, further than our brains. We must be able to take that word that we hear and connect it to our heart and connect it to our spirit. It is only in the correct understanding of the word of God through application can take place. So we lack change because we lack understanding. When the word is only in your head, 
the enemy comes and he snatches it away. He does not allow it to take root or get into your heart. And as a result, we cannot produce fruit because it does not take any root. Then he says this, the seed that falls on rocky grounds, it refers to someone who hears the word of God and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When troubles or persecution come because of this word, they quickly fall away. Now, because the seed, when it is sown, is not allowed to take root or establish itself in your life, when persecution and correction comes, we become easily offended. These are the shallow Christians. These are the people who you will always find complaining. They are the fault finders. They are the immature believers. They never grow up. They never allow the word to take root. Now, I believe in every church there is one, two, or a few of these. They are easily offended. And as a result, they find it very easy to change church than to change their, themselves. Then Jesus goes on to talk about the seed that fell among the thorns. And he refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word making them very unfruitful. So, let's talk about these. These are the ones that grow up, but they never produce fruit. Does this remind you of some of those folks you know that are in church for such a long time, but no change has taken place in their life? I'm sure you know of Christian believers. The attitude, the response, the situation, their speech is still the same. They are very religious, but they have not come into a place of righteousness. And then he talked about the seed that fell on good grounds. And he refers it to someone who hears that word and they understand it. And he says, these are the ones that produces a crop. They yield 160 or 30 times what was sown. And I'm glad that the sower makes that effort and all his effort does not go in vain. Because there are always those that will receive the word that will apply the word, and that will rightly reflect that word. So what is interested today is that the sower sows good seed, but he gets different results. You see, this morning, nothing is wrong with the sower. Nothing is wrong with the seed. He's casting seed. But the environment in which the seed was placed yield different outcomes. If the sower casts seed and it does not yield a harvest, then what does the sower do? What does he do? I believe there are two options that the sower has. First, the sower takes time to cultivate that soil because he wants to get a good result. He wants the seed to grow up, to take root, to reproduce. So if the soil is not good, then he takes time to cultivate it. Or perhaps... The sower may choose no longer to cast seed into unproductive soil. The sower has the option whether to cultivate the soil or to no longer cast seed into soil that is not producing. When we study Jesus' ministry, we see him casting seed. He is sowing the words of life and he cultivated it into 12 men. But each one of those men responded differently. The good soil produced the harvest. They reflected the seed that was sown to the point where they were called Christians. They reflected so well that the people saw them as being Christ-like and they branded them as Christian. So wherever you are rooted, you have to determine to produce quality fruit. Just as the scripture says, a corrupt tree will only produce corrupt fruit. But a good tree, when it is rooted in a good environment, will produce good fruits. A farmer one day planted two fruit trees on opposite side of his property. The one he planted on one side was to provide a hedge to hide the view of an old landfill. And then the other, he planted it on the opposite side of his property so that it can provide shade and rest, and he can go and he can relax in the cool of the day where a mountain stream was flowing, and it ran down beside the field. 
as the two trees grew, both began to flowers and then eventually bear fruits. So one day the farmer decided that he would gather some fruit from the tree. So he went to the one that was nearest his house, the one that, prov that provided um, and blocked as a hedge from the hillside. He brought some fruit inside the house, and he noticed that this fruit was a little deformed. They were not very good. So he took off the fruit, he peeled it, and found that they were not edible. When he, when he began to snack on that fruit, it was very bitter. It was not tasty. And later that evening, he went to the opposite side. And while sitting on the porch, he took fruit from the tree that was planted along the stream. And he peeled that fruit, and he found it to be very delicious. After a while, the farmer thought to himself, why did one tree produce a bitter fruit? And why did the other produce such a sweet fruit? The fruit itself was greatly affected by the nutrients it received from the root. Each tree produced fruits. Each tree brought a harvest to the farmer. But the quality and the type of the fruit was different based on the environment in which they were placed. The tree that grew by the landfill was bitter. But the tree that grew by the streams was sweet. The fruit you display today is a good indicator of where you are planted. You see, the sower will always sow good seed. But if you do not allow that seed to take root, and you do not allow it to mature, the seed will never produce a good harvest. Now, the fruit of the Christian is that outward um, evidence of an inward motivation. The fruit of the Christian is an outward evidence of that inward motivation. When the inner change takes place, it is reflected in the fruit we display. That's why Matthew 7.20 tells us, by their fruits you shall know them. So while each tree served the farmer's purpose, on one side, the tree screened the view of the landfill. And on the other side, it provided a place for shade and rest. Each tree began to produce fruit. And those fruit was a reflection of what it was fed through the soil. When the environment is not rightly cultivated, when the environment is not right, the result may not be pleasing. Here is my question again. Are you bearing fruits? And what type of fruits are you bearing? Psalms 1, 3 tells us, And you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise wins souls. Psalms 52a tells us, But as for me, I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. When we address the prophetic word of Joel 1.4, we see the attack that comes to the tree. We understand that the soil is important. Now that the soil has produced a tree, we must look at what is the attack that is going to come on that tree. How the enemy attacks and destroys our testimony and our Christian walk. So Joel chapter 1 and verse 4 gives us a good indication. But let's read from verse 1. It says that the word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pindiol. Hear this, ye old men, and give air, all ye inhabitants of the land. Had this been in your days or even in the days of your father, tell your children of it. And let your children tell their children. And let their children another generation. That which the palmer worm had left, the locust has eaten. And that which the locust had left, the canker worm has eaten. 
and that which the canker worm has left, the caterpillar has eaten. Now the prophet Joel spoke to the southern kingdom of Judea. He was announcing a coming judgment of the Lord, and he's describing their present state, devastation by a successive swarms of locusts. And Judah will experience a time of farming and financial ruin. Now, this is very typical of what we are experiencing today. Salvation will come to Judah only when the people turn to God. Only at that time will they receive divine favor. So how is this prophecy applicable today? The enemy is constantly looking for that opportunity to destroy your testimony, to destroy your fruits, to destroy your tree. He's looking for that opportunity. And he comes in the form of that palmer worm. That palmer worm comes and it attacks the leaves and the fruits of the tree. This judgment starts with the palmer worm and it ends with it. When you attack the fruits of the tree, it is difficult to identify the tree because what does the scripture say? By their fruits you shall know them. So when the palmer worm comes, when the enemy comes and it destroys your fruit, it's very difficult to identify the tree. It is not that the tree is not producing. But what happens is that every time it produces, the enemy comes and destroys the fruits. Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 to 16 says, Beware of all prophets who come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from the torn bushes or figs from tassels? So the first thing that will come and attack our lives is that palmer womb. It wants to destroy your fruit. It wants to destroy your identity. It wants to destroy your sonship in God. It wants to bring you to the point where you don't know who you are as a believer. Its intention, the enemy's intention, is to destroy the fruit. The next thing that happens is the locust comes in. And the locust speaks about generational curse. It's the progression of sin in our lives that we do not address. The locust comes in a swamp and it attacks the leaves. The leaf is the life of the tree. And eventually the tree, will, when it loses its leaves, it loses its purpose. The leaf is the primary way the tree produces fruit. And the leaves also act as a defense mechanism. So you remove the leaves from the tree and you expose the tree. What happened? The tree will eventually die. The locust intention, by your progressively sinning and not addressing those sins in your life, by the generational curses, he's coming and attacking those leaves in your tree. So he's going to bring you to a point where you lose purpose, lose identity, lose motivation, lose momentum. He's exposing you. The locust attacks the most visible part of that tree, the covering, the beauty of the tree. He's destroying it. So what happens when the locust passes through? The tree is left bare. It is open to the element. But it does not stop there. Because Joel tells us that after the locust is finished, the canker worm comes in. And then the canker worm attacks the bark of the tree and destroys the remaining leaves. So by the time the canker worm destroys the bark of the tree, it's destroying the covering. The enemy intention is to bring you away from covering, bring you away from covenant, bring you away from submission and obedience. He wants to bring you into an independent spirit. The canker worm comes and attacks the bark of the tree, destroy the covering, destroy the leaves. And then finally the caterpillar comes in and it sucks the life out of the tree. So at this point there is no momentum, there is no drive. You are like in the valley of dry bones. You have lost all hope. You have lost all desire. You have lost the zeal and the enthusiasm to get back into the house of God, to hear the word of God, to spend time in prayer. You're going through the motion. So the major application of the point I'm making here this morning is that your purpose is to bear fruit, to be fruitful and multiply. If we don't protect ourselves under God, then the enemy is going to come in and destroy every facet of our being. In every garden, 
in every vineyard, there is always the opportunity to be discouraged. Weeds, insect, mildew will flourish, disease will come upon the vineyard. And in every likewise, likewise, there are elements that will hinder the production and hinder us from producing healthy fruits. It would be easy with all the negative elements that is coming to our lives to become discouraged. In that vineyard that the Bible talks about in John 15, it is easy to quit. It is easy to think that this is too much. I am tired. I've tried too hard. It is easy to become frustrated, to make an excuse. It is easy to come to the point where we are no longer bearing fruit. We are no longer a testimony. We are no longer rightly represented. But listen to me this morning. Here is a wonderful truth. If you let the vine dresser direct your part, if you let Christ direct your part, you will not be tired in the work of God. You will not be tired of bearing fruit. You will not be stressed. You will not be confused. You will simply bear fruits and you will enjoy the process. So I ask you the question this morning as we close. Are you bearing fruits? And if not, why not? If not, why not? Think on these terms this morning. Thanks again for engaging us. It has always been a pleasure that we can come and we can spend this equipping moment with you. I want you to feel free to contact us and let, you know, let us know if this message has been a blessing to you. So I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. That the Lord will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. That the Lord will lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May God bless you. May you be safe and be well. If you have been blessed by this message and would like to support our ministry, you can do so by giving. All the information will be provided on the screen. Now let's go to this week's announcement. This week on Tuesday night at 7 p.m., we have prayer and Bible study. I encourage you to join in and be a part of this interactive session as we dive deeper into the Word of God. Then. To all our kids, we have Kids Ministry now online. In the Kids Zoom, they have so much fun interacting and engaging with their friends online as they learn more about God's Word. Then we are back here next week Sunday for our equipping moment. It's been a pleasure being with you. I look forward to seeing you next week Sunday. Do have a safe and a blessed week.